Yeah, so we are talking about the proof of Marchenko Pasteur. So we want to see what is the <coughs> asymptotic eigenvalue distribution uh, of the Wichert matrices. Uh, the Wichert matrices is given by, uh, yeah, by our data independent copies of Gaussian random vectors which are uh, distributed according to a normal distribution uh, with mean zero and in general we can have a covariance but for Marchenko Pasteur uh, the covariance is the identity matrix. Huh? So this means uh, in our Wichert, in our matrix X all entries are independent and they all have the same Gaussian distribution uh, with, uh, yeah, with, with variance normalized uh, to one. Uh, or yeah, good. Okay, and then we have seen in uh, histograms that we get a very specific uh, asymptotic eigenvalue distribution, and Marchenko Pasteur really tells us what this is, uh, and we are going to prove this. And the proof, uh, yeah, we do an analytic proof by using the resolvent. So we want to show that the resolvent of our matrix converges uh, to the uh, to the Stiltis transform uh, of the of the Marchenko Pasteur. Uh, okay, so I mean, so we have, uh, um, yeah, I mean our Wichert matrix is 1 over n, x, x transpose, and x are these columns of the independent Gaussian vectors. Um, yeah, and then we looked on the Steeltius transform of the matrix matrices, and we have to see that they converge to the Steeltius transform of the Marchenko Pasteur. And of course, uh, we look on the asymptotics, where the size of uh, the matrix, uh, or uh, where the, the size of the vectors and the number of observations uh, goes, uh, yeah, uh, to in the same speed to infinity. Uh, so what we look at, at is where p divided by n also has a limit. Uh, so n goes to infinity, and p also goes to infinity, so that the ratio converges to gamma. Uh, and gamma is here between 0 and 1, uh, so that we don't have an atom uh, at 0. Good. Uh, okay, so I mean x is here, x is a, is a p by n matrix. Uh, so the each column is a vector in p dimensions, and we have n independent copies of them. Okay, so that's the in independent guys, and that's the Wichert matrix, and we want to see what this is. And I, and I, re I wrote down a formula for the limiting uh, eigenvalue distribution. Maybe I don't repeat it now because I mean we our goal is also to to calculate this. Uh, it's not just uh, to check that in indeed it is is the limit, but we want also to see how do I really calculate the limit uh, without knowing it beforehand. So maybe I'm not writing it down now, but hopefully we will get it later and see how, how we get the formula for the limit. Um, okay, so yeah, so maybe let let me recall the, the this uh, Steeltius transform. Uh, so that's that's the Steeltius transform. So for our matrices, this is what is it? The expected value of the normalized trace, and then I take my my matrix, uh, the sigma hat minus uh, set is the argument, set times the identity matrix in p dimensions, and the inverse of this. Uh, so the inverse of this is the resolvent of this operator. I take the trace of this, and I take the expectation over the whole ensemble. Uh, and we know by concentration, the expectation and the generic uh, realization are very close to each other. Uh, okay, so in principle, I can calculate uh, what happens in a typical realization by looking on the expectation. Uh, and calcu calculating expectations is much easier than, than really calculating it uh, precisely. Okay, and that, that's here the same. I mean, this here in the limit, this is the corresponding integral, 1 over t minus z. And then I have here the Marchenko Pasteur density, which I want to calculate dt. Okay, and so what we did was, I mean, how, how, how do we get this guy here? We tried to derive an equation for it. Uh, and this equation, I mean, we, we tried to derive an equation for Sn, uh, for, for large n, and then look what happens with this equation in the limit. And the idea of this equation was uh, that we compare the situation uh, with n observations with the situation where I have n minus 1 observations. Uh, this means I'm, I'm throwing away in my matrix X uh, one column. Uh, and I mean if, if n is large, it both should be close to the Stevens transforms, should be more or less the same, but on the other hand I can express what 
I can calculate what happens uh, if I throw away this with the resolvent. So I get relations between them, and that's what we saw last time. And so uh, we got, that was where we stopped last time, uh, the equation for Sn uh, that gamma plus z times gamma Sn of z is close uh, to gamma Sn of z divided by 1 plus gamma Sn of z. Uh? Okay, and of course I can divide out the gamma here. So I have here 1, gamma, gamma. Okay, and then if I go to infinity, this, this will be an equation for the limiting steel disk transform. Uh? Okay, and of course one has to show that the steel disk transforms have a limit, uh, but in principle this follows from the knowledge that I have equations like this and general properties of steel disk transforms and compactness arguments. Uh? So I don't want to go into this. Uh? So we just take this as granted that there is a limit, uh? but then this here tells me what the equation for the limit is. Uh, so let me call this then S. So S of Z is now the limit of the steel disk transforms of Sn of Z if n goes to infinity, but I mean P also goes to infinity uh, like gamma n. Mm, okay. Uh, so that's the limit which we consider. Uh, and then of course this here gives us the equation for the limit, so namely uh, 1 plus z times s of z uh, is equal to s of z divided by 1 plus gamma uh, s of z. Mm. And of course, it depends on gamma. Huh? So I mean the, the distribution will depend on gamma, so this, this s of z also depends on gamma. Good. Okay, and this is now, I mean, this is now a quadratic equation for S of Z. Uh, I mean, S of Z as a function of Z. Z is the variable it's showing up here. So this is a quadratic equation, which, of course, we can solve. Uh, so really explicitly. Uh, so may maybe let me also write it as a quadratic equation by multiplying it with this. So what, what I have here is maybe uh, that I have gamma. If I multiply this, so it's gamma z s of z squared minus 1 minus z minus gamma times f of z uh, plus 1 is equal to 0. Huh? So just writing it as a quadratic really equation in uh, s of z. And then of course we have the formula. I mean the coefficients are here and then I can write down what the solution is. Um, so namely the solution is given by this coefficient here, 1 minus z minus gamma. Then I have a square root plus minus. Of course, I have two solutions. So I have here uh, the square of this. So let me write as z plus gamma minus 1 squared minus 4 times this coefficient, gamma z. And then I have to divide the whole thing by 2 gamma z. Uh, so that, that's just the solution of this quadratic equation. And of course, we have two solutions. Of course, the steel disk transform. We should make a choice. It should be unique. And in principle, we know properties the steel disk transform. Uh, if the argument is in the upper half plane, that's wha where we are, then the result should also be in the upper half plane. Uh, and this means I have to choose here the plus sign. Because with the minus sign, I get a solution in the lower half plane, which is not uh, an admissible value, <coughs> value for a steel disk transform. Okay, so we have to choose here plus because we have knowledge about, I mean, how a steel disk transform uh, should behave. Uh, so, because we know that the solution should be in the upper half plane uh, if the argument is in the upper half plane. Okay, for steel disk transforms. Uh, so that's the upper half plane, the complex plane. So that's where the imaginary part is positive. Good. Okay, and now we have uh, now we have the solution for the Cauchy transform. Uh, for okay, if I say Cauchy transform, I mean steel disk transform. Uh, I mean the steel disk transform and the Cauchy transform uh, are the same up to a sign and different communities. One of 
Some of them use the steel disk transform, usually in random matrix theory. Others use, use the Cauchy transform, that's more in operator theory. And because I'm more rooted in operator theory, uh, so usually I, I think about the Cauchy transform. Huh? But, but here in the, in the random matrix context, it's a steel disk transform, as I have defined it. Huh? But if I say Cauchy transform, I really mean steel disk transform. Huh? Okay, the difference is, is just a minus. But what we have here is, is with this sign, it, it's really the steel disk transform. Okay, so we have a solution for the steel disk transform. And of course, this should be then, if everything fits together, the steel disk transform of the Machenko Pasteur law. Huh? Okay, <coughs> and of course, one has to know that the steel disk transform. Uh, determines the, the distribution uniquely. So in principle, we, we would have to check that if I integrate this with the Marchenko Pasteur density, which I have given you, you get this result. But of course, this is a bit unsatisfying because maybe if, if you really have to face such a problem, maybe you do your calculations, you get the steel disk transform in the end, but a priori you don't know the density. So maybe I better should tell you how you get from the knowledge of this steel disk transform really the formula for Marchenko Pasteur. Uh, and that's really, that's really a, a, a nice formula, the steel disk inversion formula, which tells you how you get the density out of this. Uh, and that, that's what we want to do. <coughs> uh, of course, for finishing the proof, you could just, in principle, just calculate this and see that it gives you this. Uh, but this is not, not so satisfying. So let, let me give you the steel disk inversion formula, which tells you how you really get the distribution out of the steel disk transform. Uh, so this is called the steel disk inversion formula. Um, yeah, and so I, I'm doing this in a context where we, where we are, where we have a density, huh? we have a distribution with, with a density, so let psi be our density, and it should be, let's say, a continuous uh, probability density. On the real numbers, and then what we're looking at is the steel disk transform uh, so let me write it down again so s of z <coughs> is by definition this integral 1 over z minus t psi of t dt uh, integrating this kind of resolvent with respect to my density. Uh, and usually I avoid with the set, I avoid the real axis because otherwise I might have here 1 over 0, which is problematic at least. Uh, so usually the CDS transform is defined in the upper half plane. Okay, and now uh, in yeah, the Steel's inversion formula tells me that I can recover the density by going to the real axis. Uh, so I mean... I Still, this transform is defined in the upper half plane, so I can go to the real axis, uh, and in a sense, I converge to my probability distribution, and if I have a density, I will really just converge to this density. Uh, so this means, in <coughs> particular, that my steel disk transform has a continuous extension to the real axis. Uh, and the imaginary part of this gives me the density. Uh, so the statement is, the steel disk transform has a continuous extension to not just the upper half plane, but I can also go to the real axis. And the density, I mean that's what I really want, is actually 1 over pi times, times the imaginary part of the steel disk transform. Uh, or maybe if, if you want to say it in terms of this uh, continuous extension, uh, we just take 1 over pi, and then we take the limit, epsilon going to 0, of the imaginary part of the steel disk transform. So if I want to have the density at t, I should go a little bit in the upper half plane. So I'm adding i times epsilon. Uh, so I mean, I'm in a complex plane. I want my density at t, but then I'm looking at the point t plus i epsilon. Take the steel disk transform there, the ima imaginary part of this, uh, and then I let epsilon go to zero. Uh, so then I, I really go to t, and there I recover this density uh, psi of t. Uh, that's 
the Stilges inversion formula, and maybe maybe let me give you an idea why this is true. Huh? So this is, I mean, not not too hard because essentially one one has to see what what is the imaginary part uh, of the Stilges transform. Huh? So let me write this down. So one over pi imaginary part of the Stilges transform at this point t plus i epsilon. Uh, so this is 1 over pi. And then I take the imaginary part of this integral. And of course, imaginary part, that's a linear thing. So this is the integral <coughs> over the imaginary part of 1 divided by uh, z. And z is now the argument is t plus i epsilon. Um, yeah, so I have, uh, let me see. Um, let me see. Is this the Stilges transform, what I have there? Or this is the Cauchy transform, what I have defined there. Uh, so the Stilges transform is the other way around, t minus z. So that's the Stilges transform. Yeah, there it was okay. Good, okay, so it's, it's the imaginary part of uh, t. t is my integral integration variable, and then I'm subtracting the set. Uh, no, t is already used here, so maybe better I'm integrating now over uh, s. Uh, so I'm writing here ds. So s, and then I'm subtracting z, which is t plus i epsilon. So I'm subtracting minus t plus i epsilon. OK, I have to take the imaginary part of this. And so this is the imaginary part of 1 over a complex number. And of course, I can write this very nicely in terms of the real and the imaginary part of, of what I have here in the denominator. Uh, so namely, what is the imaginary part of 1 over z? Uh, I mean, z is this guy here, this real part s minus t, and imaginary part epsilon, minus epsilon. Uh, so the imaginary part of 1 over z, of course, this is 1 over i and then I take 1 over z minus 1 over z bar. Uh, that's a general formula for the imaginary part. I take the number, I subtract its complex conjugate, uh, and then I divide by 2i. That gives me the imaginary part. And of course, this here I can write in a nicer form. So this is 2i uh, and 1 over z. Mm, yeah, maybe I write it like this. This, of course, I write as z times z bar, and then I have z bar minus z. Uh, okay, so that I have something real in the den denominator, and here I have essentially now the imaginary part of, of z. Uh, if I divide it by this, uh, and with a minus sign, uh, because the imaginary part is z minus z bar. Uh, so what I have here now is just the imaginary part of z divided by z times z bar. Okay, uh, so it's, it's easy to calculate uh, this here. Let me continue with this. Uh, so this is then 1 over pi integral, and then the imaginary part of this. So this is the imaginary part of z, but what is the imaginary part of z? So z is this guy here now. Imaginary part of this is, uh, yeah, I mean I also have a minus sign here. Uh, so this is imaginary part of this is minus epsilon with this minus sign here. It is plus epsilon. And then I have to divide by z times z bar. So And this is, of course, the, the square of the length of this uh, complex number. So it's the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. The real part here is s minus t. So it's s minus t squared plus imaginary part is minus epsilon. So it's plus epsilon squared. Uh, okay, and of course in my integration I have forgotten my density because the Stilges transform is integrating with respect to the density and the density is real, uh, so this I can take out of the imaginary part. Uh, the imaginary part is just the imaginary part of this guy uh, because this guy here is, is, is real, uh, it's, it's really a uh, probability uh, density for my probability, yeah? so with three numbers. Okay, and now what I have here is exactly this here. And in principle, 
I want to see what happens if epsilon goes to zero, and this here is, you can say, an approximation of the delta function at the point, uh, uh, this is a function of, of s. Uh, so it's an it's approximation of the delta function at the point t. Uh, and then this whole integral converges to psi of t. Uh, okay. Okay, I mean, one has to make this rigorous either by working with distributions or talking about probability distributions, but the idea is, is just that, that this guy here, together with this 1 over pi, this is really an approximation for the delta peak at the point t. Uh, so, I mean, this, so, I, so if t is fixed, this function here, this is, is something for small epsilon, this looks somehow like this. Uh, so, it's peaked around this point here. The area under this curve is, is equal to 1 together with this 1 over pi. And if epsilon goes to 0, this peak is getting smaller and smaller. And what I get is really a, an approximation of the delta function at this point, which means this integral here gives me exactly the value of psi at the point t. Of course, psi has to be continuous for, for those arguments. Huh? Okay, huh? so this converges <coughs> if epsilon goes to 0 in some way. Huh? which one has to make precise, but okay, I don't want to make this precise, to, to the delta function at t. And then if I'm integrating over the delta function, I just recover here uh, the value of psi at the point t. Uh? So this is, if epsilon goes to zero, this converges to, uh, let me say, <coughs> the delta function at the point t in the argument s, psi of s ds, and this is equal psi of t. Okay, or may maybe more generally in the language of probability distributions, one can say uh, that what I get here, this imaginary part, 1 over pi, this guy here, this is a probability distribution which converges weakly uh, to the probability distribution from which I started. Uh, that's, that's a more general uh, way of saying this. So this, this inversion formula also has a meaning if if I don't have a density. Uh, but in the case of a nice density, it's really, uh, I can recover the density directly by taking this limit here. Good, okay, so that's the Steele's inversion formula, and now we can apply it uh, to our situation. Uh, so we have here, I mean, we have here the Steele's transform of a density, and we have an explicit formula, so we can look explicitly what is the limit uh, if if, if I go with epsilon to zero at the point t plus i epsilon. Okay, so just combining this with this, we should now really be able to get the formula for Machenko Pastur. Huh? I mean, even, even if we don't know it beforehand. Okay, so we apply this to, yeah, the steel this transform, which we got here in our calculation for the Wishart matrices. So there, just let me write it down again. What we had there as of z is equal to 1 minus z minus gamma plus the square root of, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and maybe uh, I rewrite this in a form which we had also uh, in the Machenko Pastur. I mean, it, it will be important to see when is what I have under the square root, when is this real and when, uh, when, when is it positive and when is it negative. Uh, because if I want to get an imaginary part of a square root, uh, I mean all the guys which I have here, if I go to the real axis, will, will be just real numbers. Uh, so I have, a, real, I have a, a square root of a real number and I can only get an imaginary part if I'm taking the square root of a negative number. Because then I will get uh, a multiple of, of, of the complex of, of i. So it will be important to see uh, for which set, or, or maybe if I go to the real axis, for which t, is this here positive and where is it negative? So it's, it's good to know where are the zeros of this guy. Uh, and so I mean this here, uh, I'm writing as z minus gamma plus times z minus gamma minus. Uh, and gamma plus and gamma minus are essentially the two roots of what I have uh, under the square root. And this was what I defined in the Machenko Pastur statement. I mean, this, this depends on gamma. Uh, so gamma plus minus was, what was it? I think one plus minus the square root of gamma squared. Uh, okay. Uh, so, I mean, it's easy to see. If, if you multiply this out, then you get exactly this here. Uh. 
So this is just uh, <coughs> yeah, looking on, on the roots. Good, okay, so we apply it to this. And what I, what I have to take is one over pi, uh, the imaginary part of, of this thing here. Uh, so uh, I have to take one over pi s of t, or t plus i epsilon, and then epsilon goes to zero. But I mean, if I have a nice extension, I can just take essentially the same formula on the real axis. Uh, so I get here, uh, this is, uh, and of course I have forgotten here, to divide it by two gamma set. Okay, uh, so I, I go to the real axis, so in principle I replace here every set by t, and then, of course, I mean this guy here, this is just 1 minus t minus gamma, this doesn't have an imaginary part, because t is a real number. Uh, okay, so the only place where I can get an imaginary part is, is from this square root. Uh, so what I get is 1 over pi, and then I have the imaginary part of this here, t minus gamma plus times t minus gamma minus the square root of this and this divided by 2 gamma t. Good. Okay. Uh, and so <coughs> the situation now is, I mean, I have, I have this gamma minus and I have this gamma plus, uh, two numbers, positive numbers. Uh, and then, of course, if the number which I have under the square root, if this is a real number, uh, then the square root is, is just, if this is a positive number, then the square root is just uh, a real number and there is no imaginary part. Uh, this means whenever this guy here is positive, I don't have, I, I get just here zero. Uh, and of course this happens if either t is bigger than gamma plus, because then it's bigger than gamma plus and gamma minus, so this is positive and this is positive. Uh, so on this side, I will get, I will get zero, and it also happens if t is smaller than gamma minus, uh, because then both guys are negative, so the product is positive, and I have the, re the square root of a positive number, which is real and has no imaginary part. So this means on this side, uh, I also zero. But if I'm in between, then this guy here, I mean, <coughs> then uh, this is positive and this is negative, so I get the square root of a negative number, and this is i times the square root of, of uh, what I had before, but with the minus sign. Uh, so thi and then I have an imaginary part. Uh, so this means what I get here in between, let me write it down. So first of all, I get zero uh, if I'm outside of this interval, and in between, I get this 1 over 2 pi, uh, gamma t, and then I get the square root, uh, but now I have to, to multiply it with a minus sign. Uh. So before I had the square root of something negative, uh, and now, and this is i times the square root of the corresponding positive quantity, so I just switch the sign here, so I have here gamma plus minus t times t minus gamma minus. Uh. So th this is now a positive quantity inside this interval. Uh, okay, and so, yeah, so this happens for, for t between gamma minus and gamma plus. Okay, and otherwise it's zero. Uh, and so this is explicit formula, and that, that is exactly what we claimed in Machenko Pasteur. Uh, but, but now you see how you really get it from, uh, from our concrete formula for the Stiltis transform. Uh, and I mean, this looks somehow, I don't know, it, look, it has some distribution like this. Uh, depending, of course, on, on gamma. Uh, and ga I mean, gamma is in gamma plus and gamma minus. Uh, this depends on, on gamma. Okay, so, so, yeah, this is more or less the proof. I mean, I have not some rigorous details I have omitted, but I mean, I have shown you the, the main calculation, which really shows you how you get the result. And I think that that may be the most important thing that we really can calculate this. Uh, and in particular, we also you see from this also that that really you get you get something which is only has a density on some interval. Uh, so I, I mean outside here it is really zero, which comes from the effect that that I mean I have to the square root, I have to take the imaginary part of, of a square root. Good. Okay. So questions about this. 
Yeah, I mean, in the assignments, you are asked to do similar things. First of all, we looked here on Wishart matrices, which are in our context maybe the important ones. But then there's another ensemble of random matrices, Wigner matrices, which are symmetric matrices, uh, which are maybe even more famous, or I mean, they are used uh, a lot in physics, uh, and maybe they are the ones for which such a calculation was done first, and this was done by Wigner, and there the eigenvalue distribution is Wigner semicircle law. Uh, and you are asked to prove this in the assignments by following similar ideas as we did it here. Okay, and then of course, in our context for the Wishart matrices, one can also consider the situation uh, where the covariance matrix is not just the identity matrix, but something more general. Uh, for example, maybe half of its eigenvalues could be one, the other half could be two, and we saw su numerical simulations. And then of course you get, you get also something which has a compact support, but which looks somehow different. And in principle, one can also follow ideas from here and derive equations for this. Okay, but usually those equations are not leading to quadratic equations, but they are more complicated, and usually you cannot really solve them explicitly, but you, really, but you can solve them numerically by iteration procedures. Uh, and in assignments, you're also asked to look on one, one example of this type. Uh, so in principle, one can also understand the more general situation, uh, but then, of course, at some point, one has to do numerics even to get the, the solution for the Steeltis transform. Good, okay, so in assignments, which, which are up on the, uh, on the internet, uh, yeah, you, you can do more in this direction. Huh? You can check whether you are able to, to use these ideas which I have given you here in, in a little bit different context. That's it for today. <laughs>